take control of your mind and your thoughts and focus on your breathing. Feel the power of you, the real you, controlling your breathing. real you is always present right now. You are more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine because you get to focus on the greatest gift ever. Now, your presence, where your attention is being drawn to now, no matter what's going on outside your mind. Feel the power of your breathing. There are astronomical numbers of things going on in one breath. That's how powerful you are. That's how powerful your determination is. So let's use that power. Let's use that third eye, that mind's eye that we all have. Let's use it right now. And let's see ourselves doing the best we can on all the stretches and exercises today in our gym period. Gym. G-Y-M. Grow your mind. And here we are in the gym of life. Growing our minds and growing our bodies taking control of what we truly are, simply being a human being, the most powerful energy thing in the universe. That's who you really are. So see yourself right now, see it in your mind, because whatever you see in your mind, you can make real with your eyes open. Everything created with your eyes closed can be made real with your eyes open.
in for a fifth maybe it's Messi oh yes يكون يعتقدون غير ذلك بان خطه الدفاع با 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 ميسي وسجل Good morning, everybody. I want to talk today about the power of positivity and just how powerful our minds are in looking for positivity everywhere. I remember Tony Robbins saying that whatever we focus on, that's where energy flows. So where focus goes, energy flows. And energy, your thought, your ability to think, is the greatest form of energy in the universe. So think about that and let's apply it today. Look for positivity everywhere. Be relentless. Wherever you are, whatever you're experiencing, whoever you're with, look for the positive. It is not being blind to reality. It is taking your powerful mind and actually focusing on what's positive in this world because there's so much that's positive. You do that, and that power of your positivity is endless, and it will affect endless others. So I challenge you now and forever to do it. Have a great day, everybody. Selling garbage bags door to door was easy, right? He goes like, 12 year old Mark going, Hi, my name is Mark. Do you use garbage bags? You know what the answer is going to be. Well, nobody wants a car because horses are great and we're used to them and they can eat grass. And there's lots of grass all over the place and there's no gasoline that people can buy. So people are never gonna, never get, never gonna get cars. Um, people did say that. You know? A way to slip into day two thinking mm -hmm. would be to manage your business to metrics that you don't really understand and you're not really sure why they were invented in the first place and you're not sure they're still as relevant as they used to be. You gotta be careful about what you compete in. It's a good thing I don't have a competitive spirit in chess or you know, you know or football or anything. for any given decision that you're going to make there's upside and downside but in aggregate if you are stagnant and you don't make those changes then i think you're guaranteed to fail hey it's evan carmichael and i watch these videos every day because i need them for motivation being around successful entrepreneurs every morning helps me believe that i can do great things too it's like your morning coffee but for your goals kickstarting your day with a blast of positivity so here is a challenge for you Try watching one video every morning for the next 30 days. And let's find out together if they help you do great things too. If you're in, leave a hashtag believe in the comments below so I can celebrate with you. So today let's live your best believe life and learn the seven best lessons from the seven richest billionaires. Believe. One of the things that happens in business, probably anything that you're, where you're, you know, you have an ongoing program and something is is underway for a number of years is you develop certain things that you're managing to like let's say the typical case would be a metric and that metric isn't the real underlying thing and so uh you know maybe the metric is um efficiency metric around customer contacts per unit sold or something like if you sell a million units, how many customer contacts do you get? Or how many returns do you get? And so on and so on. And so what happens is a little bit of a kind of inertia sets in where somebody a long time ago invented that metric. And they invented that metric. They decided we need to watch for, you know, customer returns per unit sold as an important metric. But they had a reason why they chose that metric the person who invented that metric and decided it was worth watching. And then fast forward five years, that metric is the proxy. Mm -hmm. The proxy the real for thing, truth, I the guess. The proxy for truth, the proxy for customers, let's say in this case, it's a proxy for customer happiness. Yeah. And But that metric is not actually customer happiness, it's a proxy for customer happiness. The person who invented the metric understood that connection. Five years later, 
it, a kind of inertia can set in and you forget the truth behind why you were watching that metric in the first place and the world shifts a little yeah. and now that proxy isn't as valuable as it used to be or it's missing something and you have to be on alert for that you have to know okay this is i don't really care about this metric i care about customer happiness mm -hmm. and this metric is worth putting energy into and following and improving and scrutinizing only in so much as it actually affects customer happiness and so you've got to constantly be on guard and it's very very common this is a nuanced problem it's very common especially in large companies that they are managing to metrics that they don't really understand they don't really know why they exist and the world may have shifted out from under them a little and the metrics are no longer as relevant as they were when somebody 10 years earlier invented the metric that is a nuance but uh that's a big problem, right? It's a huge there's, some, problem. there's something so compelling to have a nice metric to try to optimize. Yes. And by the way, you do need metrics. Yes, you do. You know, you can't ignore them. Um, you want them. But you just have to be constantly on guard. This is, you know, a, a way to slip into day two thinking mm -hmm. would be to manage your business to metrics that you don't really understand. And you're not really sure why they were invented in the first place. And you're not sure they're still as relevant as they used to be. Lesson number two is find your passion with Bill Gates. I know when I was a student and, you know, so fascinated by math problems, you know, some of the other students were like, yeah, that's so boring. Why should we care about that? If they'd really known how much more interesting my life was going to be, you know, in terms of meeting interesting people, you know, maybe they would have worked on those math problems. I don't know. Uh, uh, I didn't know. Uh, I, I just liked, uh, you know, the puzzles and found them uh, very interesting. But, you know, I'm so lucky uh, that I get to work with incredible people. You know, if somebody's made a breakthrough that's going to improve health, you know, like the people working on this low cost gene therapy, I get to sit and talk to them and, you know, bring my past experience of, okay, what worked at Microsoft, what didn't work, you know, how do we build partnerships? How do we get enough money? How do we help them, you know, say it's gonna take 10 years. A lot of good technologies take patience and you have to, you know, be willing uh, to deal in, in very high risk to get something that's going to be dramatic. And so the work I do, the, the people I get to meet, uh, and even though many projects don't succeed, uh, a high enough percentage do um, that I get to see the results of that. And so it's really the, the quality of the people you work with and the, the profound nature of the problems you get to work on that, you know, take for me, you know, what is, you know, I'm not working to um, save money uh, or something. Uh, but still make it the thing I, I choose to do. Lesson number three is learn to sell with Mark Cuban. Selling is just helping. I've always looked at it about putting myself in the shoes of another person and asking a simple question. Can I help this person? Can my product help them? From the time I was 12 years old, selling garbage bags door to door and just asking a simple question. Do you use garbage bags? Do you need garbage bags? Well, let me save you some time. I'll bring them to your house and drop them off to, you know, streaming. Um, why do we need streaming when we have TV and radio? Well, you can't get access to your TV and radio everywhere you go. So we kind of break down geographic and physical barriers and, you know, cost plus drugs, you know, what's the product that we actually sell? We sell trust. Um, in a simplistic approach, we buy drugs and sell drugs, but we add transparency to it and bringing transparency to an industry is, is a differentiation and it helps people. Are you born with it? Or can you develop it? Oh, you if can definitely develop it. Yeah. I mean, because selling garbage bags door to door was easy, right? It was like 12 year old Mark going, hi, my name is Mark. Do you use garbage bags? You know what the answer is going to be, right? Can I just drop them off for you? You know, once a week, whenever you need them, you just call and I'll bring them down. Sure. So that was easy. But I'm sure you've been rejected. Oh yeah, of course. Not everybody says yes. What's your what was your percentage? I don't remember, but it's pretty close to 100%. <laughs> oh, okay. No. So that's why you don't remember. <laughs> yeah, right. Because who's going to say no to a 12-year-old kid yeah, who's sure. going to save time and money? But, you know, typically my career where I've started companies, it's 
to do something that other people aren't doing, whether it was connecting PCs and to local area networks and at micro solutions. And, you know, the salesmanship was walking into a company and just saying, look, talk to me and I can help you improve your productivity and your profitability. Is that important to you? And the answer is obviously always yes. And then the question is, can I do the job and can I do it cost effectively? And so you didn't have to be a born salesperson to be able to ask those questions, but you have to be able to be willing to put in the time to learn that business. And that's the hardest part. I'm sure there's a skill thing to it too in like how you solve the puzzle of communicating with a person and convincing them. Yeah, I mean, there's skill from the perspective that I read like a maniac. Then like now you can give me an example of any type of business and it'll take me two seconds to figure out how they make money and how I can make them more um, productive. And I think that's probably my biggest skill, being able to just drill down to what the actual need is, if any. And then, you know, from there being able to say, well, if this is what this company does and this is what their goal is, how can I introduce something new that they haven't seen before? And is that a business that I can create and make money from? Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight our favorite lessons from the video that will inspire you to remember what you learned today and actually apply them. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Lesson number four is take risks with Mark Zuckerberg. In a world
kick so take down, away, kick so down, so kick so down, so down, walk it by yourself. Walk, 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 walk it by yourself and do the Cupid shuffle. Now let me see you do the Cupid shuffle. Now let me see you do the Cupid shuffle. Now let me see you do the Cupid shuffle. It's your boy Cupid, see you be the oddity. Mr. Beck on the track, got another kid in the Hey, Do your dance, do your dance. Come on, come on. Messi. Good morning, everybody. Today, Jack Ma ends off his top 10 rules for success with us. And his last one is one that stands out for me. It's have passion. This is one that is the activating force in anything great that people have ever done, that you can ever do. You have to have passion. It has to be so in you that you love it, that you breathe it, that you think it. Think about your loved ones. Think about the people you love most in this world. Think about something you've ever loved most in this world. It could be something like, I don't know, playing a video game or anything. Something that has such a powerful force. If you can have that passion and apply it to something that is worthwhile in serving others, there is no limit to what you can do. My passion is spreading as much positivity in this world. Where I stand, where I am, with the help of everybody. So I use Jack Ma's thoughts. I hope you do for now and forever. Have a great day, everybody. Good morning, everybody. world that's changing so quickly, the biggest risk you can take is not taking any risk. And I, I really think that that's true, right? I mean, a lot of people, I think, think that, um, you know, whenever it comes to, uh, whenever you get yourself into a position where you have to make some some big shift in, in direction or do something, um, you know, there are always, people are going to point to the, the downside risks of that decision. And locally, they're may be right, right? I mean, it, it, for any given decision that you're going to make, there's upside and downside. But in aggregate, if you are stagnant and you don't make those changes, then um, then I think you're guaranteed to fail, right? And, and not, not catch up. So to some degree, I think it's really right that over time, the biggest risk that you can take is to not take any risks. Lesson number five is control your controllables with Steve Ballmer. Steve, is that your best advice the next generation of leaders to to be hard hardcore and work your ass off and you will find success i can't guarantee you'll find success whatever success means to you i think it's a good way to do the ride but things take you know some good ideas a lot of hard work some luck I mean, people deny the importance of luck so in a sense what you want to do is control your controllables you can control how hard you work and you, you know, might come up with the right idea, you might not, but you can control how hard you work. Lesson number six is don't reason by analogy with Elon Musk. I think it's also important to reason from first principles rather than by analogy. So the normal way that we conduct our lives is we, 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 we reason by analogy. Um, it's, we're doing this because it's like something else that was done mm -hmm. or it's like what um, other people are doing. Me too type ideas. 
Yeah, a slight, well, iter yeah, a slight iteration yeah. on, on, on a theme. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and, and it's, it, cause it's, it's, it's kind of mentally easier to reason by analogy rather than from first principles. But by first principles is kind of a physics way of looking at the world. And what that really means is you kind of boil things down to the most fundamental truths and, and say, okay, what are we sure is true or, or as sure as possible is true? And then reason up from there. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a lot more mental energy. Um, Give me but, an example of that. Like, what's one thing that you've, you've done that on that you feel has worked for you? Sure. So, um, somebody could say, um, in fact, people do, uh, that battery packs are really expensive and that's just the way they'll always be because that's the way they've been in the past. Um, you're like, well, no, that's, that's pretty dumb, you know, because if, if, uh, if you apply that reasoning to anything new, that ha then you, you wouldn't be able to, to ever get to that new thing. Right. Um, so, um, you know, it's like you can't say, oh, you know, horses, well, nobody wants a car because horses are great and we're used to them and they can eat grass and there's lots of grass all over the place and, you know, there's not like a, there's no gasoline that people can buy, so people are never going never get, never to get cars. Right. Um, but people did say that. And lesson number seven, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is analyze your competition with Warren Buffett. You have a competitive spirit, clearly. Yeah. Clearly. Well, but you gotta be, you gotta be careful about what you compete in. You know, I, it's a good thing I don't have a competitive spirit in chess or, you know, you know or football or anything like that. No, I just, I'm, 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 I'm an observer there. I, I enjoy watching things like that. But I, I try to keep my competitive spirit in a game where I can win. Do you have a killer instinct? Nah, not exactly. I, I've got, I wouldn't call it a killer instinct, but I do, I do know this. When I want to do something, I always want to do it big. What does that I mean? put my whole net worth in city service preferred, you know. <laughs> $120. Hundred fourteen dollars and seventy five cents. I put my whole net worth in, in, and I've never since I was well since that day in you know March eleventh, uh, nineteen forty two. I have never had less than eighty percent of my money in American business. You can call them stocks or but equities, I, but I see them as American business. I, I've owned a piece of American business. For eight, at least eighty percent at all times. In, you know, I, I just I don't want to own anything else. <laughs> I, I want to own a home and you know things my family wants and all that. But owning five homes doesn't mean anything to me because I'm I can be happy in one home. And, and there's a certain amount of things that go wrong with everything. And <laughs> if I got two homes, I I know I've got more problems and I don't have more happiness. <laughs> what brings you the happiness? Oh, that. I would have to be honestly say that that, that what makes me happiest is what I'm doing. What I'm doing, you know. I, 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 am, I enjoy two things about it. One, I know I'll win over time. That doesn't mean I'll beat everybody else or anything like that. But I'll, I, I mean, the game is very, very, very easy if you have the right lessons in your mind about what you're buying. I'm not buying stocks. I'm buying pieces of overwhelmingly American business. Uh, and I'm happy when that's happy, and when that's, uh, when I'm doing it. I'm happy when stocks are going down. I'm happier when stocks are going down because I, I, I can buy more of them with the same amount of money. I'd be happy if I was a farmer. I'd want farmland to go down uh, so I could buy more acreage. You know, if I was, I mean, it just makes sense. What are your thoughts on the innovations in education today? Thank you. Uh, just thoughts on education. Um, well, um, I, I think there's maybe a, um, there are definitely some good schools out there, um, but I think the, some of the, the mistakes, at least in my opinion, that I see being made in education is um, that the, um, people, the, the, the teachers do not explain why kids are being taught a subject, um, you know, just sort of get dumped into math and like, well, why are you learning math? What's the point of this? It seems like some, you know, for some people like maybe it's, like, I don't know why I'm being asked to do these strange problems. <laughs> uh, 
but, you know, the, the why of things is extremely important. Um, because, you know, our brain has evolved to not to discard information that it thinks is has no relevance. So then, if on the one hand you, uh, you're being asked to memorize or learn, uh, say, formulas, um, but you do not know why this is the case, then you have this cognitive dissonance of it seems irrelevant, but I'm being told to remember it, so I'll be punished. <laughs> so, so I better remember it. But so the why of things is very important, and then uh, being able to, and, and then <clears throat> picking kind of a, a problem, and then uh, using various educational tools to solve that problem, um, like using math or physics or economics to, to solve that problem, is far more engaging um, than teaching the tools. Um, you know, it's the difference between if you say, well, we're going to take apart this, uh, this engine um, and, and see how it works and put it back together again. Um, and then in order to take the engine apart, we need you know, wrenches and screwdrivers and a winch um, and Allen keys and, and whatnot. Um, and, 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 it's a, the, the, and then in the course of solving the problem of taking the engine apart and putting it back together, you learn about wrenches and screwdrivers and all the tools that you need. Um, and then now you understand the relevance. Ah, this is why wrenches are important. I, you know, whereas if you had a, cl a, a class on wrenches, <laughs> you'd be like, oh, why does this, this not seem that great, you know? Um, so t t t tying it to solving a problem is, I think, very powerful for um, establishing relevance and getting um, kids excited about what they're working on. Um, and then and, uh, and and having the knowledge stick. I um, went to my boss and said to him, you know, I'm going to go do this crazy thing, and I'm going to start this uh, this company selling books online. And this is something that I already been talking to him about uh, in a sort of more general context. But then he said, let's go on a walk. And we went on a two-hour walk in Central Park in New York City. And the conclusion of that was this, he said, you know, this actually sounds like a really good idea to me, but it sounds like it would be a better idea for somebody who didn't already have a good job. <laughs> uh, and he convinced me to think about it for 48 hours before making a final decision. And so I went away and, and, and was trying to find the right framework in which to make that kind of big decision. And, you know, I'd already talked to my wife about this, and she was very supportive and said, look, you know, uh, you can count me in 100%, um, whatever you want to do. You know, it's true. She had married this kind of, you know, fairly stable guy in a stable career path, and now he wanted to go do this crazy thing, but she was 100% supportive. So it really was a decision that I had to make for myself. And the, and the framework I found which made the decision incredibly easy was uh, what, what I called, which only a nerd would call, a regret minimization framework. So I wanted to project myself forward to age 80 and say, okay, now I'm looking back on my life. I want to have minimized the number of regrets I have. And you know, uh, I knew that when I was 80, I was not going to regret having tried this. I was not going to regret having wanted, you know, trying to participate in this thing called the internet that I thought was going to be a really big deal. I knew that if I failed, I wouldn't regret that. But I knew the one thing I might regret is not ever having tried. And I knew that that would haunt me every day. Um, and so when I thought about it that way, it was an incredibly easy decision. Uh, and I think that's a very good, it's, it's, if you can project yourself out to age 80 and sort of think, what will I think at that time? It gets you away from some of the daily pieces of confusion. You know, I left uh, this Wall Street firm in the middle of the year. When you do that, you walk away from your annual bonus. And that's the kind of thing that in the short term can confuse you. But if you think about the long term, uh, then you can really make good life decisions that you won't regret later. Certainly during the time I was at Harvard, It goes electric wavy when I turn it on 
All through my city, all through my home. We're flying up, no ceiling when we in our zone. I got that sunshine in my pocket. Got that good soul in my feet. I feel that hot blood in my body. And it drops. Ooh, I can't take my eyes off it. Moving so phenomenally. Alves again, Pierce for offside, not given, Messi! Wow, it will be a bar. Morning guys, uh, again I'm going to borrow from Les Brown, he, as you can see he's Got an amazing sense of humor as I'm drawing a lot of my material to remind us to laugh our way to infinite mind wealth. Les Brown, thank you so much. Here's another example. Uh, he was talking about money at one point and, uh, you know, we often have, we don't even realize it, but we self-sabotage ourselves and uh, with the idea that money is the root of all evil, when in fact, it's the uh, love of money that's the root of all evil. Well, he was giving an example where um, he was uh, talking in a speech and he said something about uh, how um, most people believe that rich people or people with a lot of money can't be happy. And then he says the example, well, he goes, I'd rather find out for myself. I'd rather become rich and find out for myself if I can be happy. So he puts a positive laughing spin on it. And I thought, yeah, we got to look at ourselves that way when it comes to money. So yeah, we'd rather find out for ourselves. Let's get rich and find out if we can be happy. Have a great day, everybody.
I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Uh, the idea that software was this field that uh, was the opportunity was unbelievable. That became more obvious during the three-year period I was here. Uh, but my dad had been a lawyer. I thought of mathematics, you know, like doing well in the Putnam. That was the coolest thing. Uh, and the computer software, I didn't think those people were as smart as the math people. So it's like, well, am I going to go into the easy field uh, or this really hard field? But uh, anyway, math uh, was fantastic. When I finally picked and decided to go, go to Microsoft, then I got into a period from age uh, 19 uh, to about 40 where I wasn't able to look at the latest on, you know, how tornadoes work or how mitochondria work. I was pretty monomaniacal. And when I was able to ask Steve, this is the year 2000, Steve Ballmer, uh, he, he mistakenly graduated, uh, but then he started at Stan... Uh, <laughs> Well, I was trying to hire him, but his parents told him you're supposed to graduate, which was fine. But then he started at Stanford Business School, and he was in his first year, and I thought, oh, this is perfect. I'll get him to drop out of Stanford Business School. Uh, so in a certain sense, he is a dropout. Uh, uh, and he was very key to the success of Microsoft. I mean, uh, he knew a lot of things. But during that period, I didn't get to do much. At Harvard... You know, I took all these courses because it was just so amazing that people were interested in talking about them. And uh, I, I have to say, I never went to a lecture during reading period or any, anything because the courses that I was actually signed up for, I finally started to work on those. Uh, so I was in Hillel the minute it would open to the minute it would close during reading period trying to catch up on, on that other set of courses. So people say I'm a dropout, which is literally true. But because I like college courses, the online college courses, there's a company called The Learning Company that I buy uh, tons and tons of their stuff. And I do you know, at least four or five courses a year. In a sense, I like uh, going to college more than anyone. Uh, so you know, I've sort of made sure my job, certainly post Microsoft, uh, that I get to spend my time meeting with scientists, uh, learning new things, you know, seeing what the hard problems are, in some cases giving money to people to take on uh, those very, very hard problems. You did personal challenges annually for about 10 years. Which, which challenge ended up being much easier than expected and which one ended up being much harder than expected? Either or. I'd just be curious to know. I still do stuff like this. I don't like make as big of a deal of it anymore. <laughs> but, but I, I mean, but I think just kind of throwing yourself into different situations to learn new things is, I don't know, I think that that's just a big part of life. So, yeah. Well, which ones were hard? One, I tried to meet a new person every day for the year. That was hard for me. I'm pretty introverted. I built some amazing relationships out of it. I, you know, I started teaching this class at the local boys and girls club with a friend and like mentored the kids for just talked to them a couple of weeks ago. They were, they were all like, none of their families had gone to college before and now they're all graduating college. It's pretty cool. That's amazing. But I'm super introverted. So I think that that's probably been another silver lining of the whole distributed work thing for me is having space to, to kind of think and, and kind of control my, my time and like not, not get interrupted by other people so much, but it's an interesting balance being introverted, but also like, being pretty sensitive and caring a lot about other people. I think that the people kind of think that, that introverts are like, you know, for like, don't like other people or something. That's not true. I just, just get overwhelmed easily. Yeah. And then some of the ones, I, the, the, the interesting thing is they all went in weird directions, right? So one year I did this like year of running and then it's like, I just did all kinds of different running. I did like, sprints i did long distance running and then like my knees started hurting so then i brought them down did triathlons and training for this iron man but then i like i broke my arm biking so that ended up not quite happening so i mean they, they all kind of go in, in different directions you know, i learned mandarin one year I learned mandarin you can't learn mandarin one year. <laughs> it's a challenging one i mean maybe someone can i cannot um you know we talked about my language deficiency earlier on but i mean that was partially i like i like kind of throwing myself into things that they're hard. And, you know, like, like I said before, I mean, I've 
I studied a lot of languages in my life, a little Spanish, a little French, a little Hebrew, a lot of Latin, a bunch of Greek, but it's, it's actually hard for me. So I kind of like doing things that are hard for me. You don't necessarily get it right the first, exactly right the first time. I mean, the car leasing business, you know, basically you were competing on the cost of money to finance cars. And, and it's very hard to delight a customer when you just give them the car and tell them to send you a monthly check for five years and you'll be back at that time. So his talents were being wasted, basically, in that business. But at the age of 40, with all of that experience behind him, he found, he, he, he found the golden key and he, he took a very ordinary business and turned it into an absolutely extraordinary uh, operation. Uh, and just like Mrs. B or Rose Bumpkin did uh, with furniture. And the, he didn't worry about whether the Federal Reserve was going to tighten or ease. He didn't worry about whether the stock market was up or down yesterday. You know, he, didn't, he didn't worry about the things he couldn't change, but he did worry, he did focus on the one thing he could change, and that was the customer's experience. And I have seen uh, the one I didn't, the one that got away, Enterprise. I went down to Florida and tried to talk him into selling to Berkshire, and he was smart enough not to do it. Probably the value of the company has quadrupled since I made that visit. Uh, but he, he was smart enough to see that he would find that business. Henry Ford, as you may know, failed twice before he started the Ford Motor Company in 1903. I mean, the, the test isn't whether you get the greatest business idea in the world the first time out. The test is whether you keep learning as you go along what your strengths are and what you can do for your customers, what you can bring especially to the party. And to do that, uh, you, need, you need the education that, that I know you've received uh, through 10,000 small businesses, but you need a genuine, a genuine desire day in, day out to delight the customer. I've never, I've never seen a business, and I've seen a lot of businesses, but I've never seen one that delights the customer that that doesn't succeed. I mean, what you want is that customer the next day when they think, do I want to rent a car or do I want to buy some furniture? What goes through their mind? You know, it's the place where they've had a great experience. Um, I don't know what I paid for this type. Actually, probably if somebody gave it to me, but for the purposes of this speech, I will <laughs> say, I, I have no idea, but what I, or the shirt I'm wearing, or this, but I do know, I will remember how I was treated when I bought it. I mean, you, you long forget about the price, but you never forget whether you had a good experience or a poor experience uh, with the purchase experience. I think like sci-fi uh, movies, video games, uh, or video, you know, you, and, and really I think people spend a lot more time on, on video games and movies these days, uh, you know, can be pretty inspiring and thought-provoking about What's the future that we want? Uh, what are some like impossible-sounding technologies that may, maybe could work somehow? Um, like, there's conceivably a way to do warp drive, but it's like it's such esoteric, super out on the edge physics. Because technically, you cannot go faster than the speed of light, uh, but but space can travel faster than the speed of light. That's what's meant by warp drive. But the amount of energy you need to warp space is unbelievably gigantic. So, um, you know, you have to like be converting matter to energy at a rate that is we have, cannot conceive, really. Um, it, you know, it can't be like something like, well, if we just convert one, convert one Jupiter per second to energy, then problem solved. Uh, like that's a lot, and there's not many Jupiters. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, and there might be a bit of radiation around that. So, 
like there are things like like, like technically the, the the universe did expand faster than the speed of light. That's that's uh, that's why we can see uh, light from uh, all these super distant stars. Um, like, yeah. So it's it's kind of pretty wild that space expanded faster than the speed of light. Um, so I'm sure we'll like figure out some strange breakthroughs um, and you know come to grips better with like this, uh, this dark matter especially, which seems like something's fishy going on there. Um, <laughs> and uh, it has bad branding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's, the universe is mostly dark energy and dark matter according to current current physics, but you know this kind of Plug in the, you plug them in the equations and they sort of work. And I'm like, eh, this, this is not a good explanation. Nobody can find the dark matter. Um, but I sort of figure, like, hey, if this was a video game and somebody had a bug in their like orbital dynamics uh, physics simulator, then I was like, oh no, we've got to figure out some way for these minions in here to uh, believe that they're in reality. So insert dark matter. First of all, I love space. I have been a space lover since I was a five-year-old boy. And I feel like I won the lottery with Amazon. I know I won the lottery. And, uh, and now I'm investing those lottery winnings in Blue Origin, which is uh, the space company. Um, we, built, we're built, we are flying a, a suborbital tourism vehicle, and we'll start taking people up hopefully in 2018. That's coming right up. Working on it for more than 10 years. Uh, uh, hopefully, this, one, this, this overnight success is taking longer than 10 years. I don't know. We'll see. You know. uh, and we're also building an orbital vehicle called New Glenn. New Shepard is named after Alan Shepard, the first American in space. He went on a suborbital journey. New Glenn is named after the American hero, John Glenn, who uh, was the first American to orbit the Earth. Uh,
right now. That's why they call it present. Presence. This is the greatest gift we have. Right now. 